Five, four, three, two, one. Never in the history of the world have the merchants of obscenity. And remember, when you, uh, if you like our show, remember to go Texaco. And available to them. The modern facilities for disseminating this film. High speed presses. Mass distribution. Did you want to grab like a frying coffee and call it a day? All have combined to put the violence obscenity within reach of every man, woman, and child in the country. Give it up for Office Max, guys. They made this whole thing happen. This traffic continues to increase and flourish. Still got plenty of For one reason. And there's only one toothpaste for this family. New Colgate Dental Cream. It is big business. Borat, Don't you want to get paid? At some time or other, the whole community has asked him to take that obscene stuff off his desk. Yeah, next time maybe do a little research. Do you always let strange people in here? The response usually amounts to some form of dollar sign logic. This fresh, delicious, tasty, meaty... You don't know how to drink your whole generation. Cold cut combo. It's my business. I'll start whatever makes a profit. You know that you can get a refill on any drink you want here. That is bad. What are you talking about? You know exactly what I'm talking about, Gary. I'm talking about you and your sewage. 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 All the refuse collects here like a stopped up cesspool. Put a price tag on it, you sell it without even batting an eye. Hi, I'm Dylan and this is Not Exactly Normal. As much as the world of the now unfortunately named content has changed fairly drastically over the past 70 plus years of broadcast history, going from variety and game shows that unknowingly had on serial killers. Well, I like bananas, so I'll take one. Number one, that's your number one, all right. Two videos of idiots choking on cinnamon. Oh! Two TikToks of insane bottle tosses, which are apparently fueled by the Chinese government. One thing hasn't changed. It all costs money, in one form or another. Hey, sorry. sorry. Don't just be sorry, just think for one <laughs> Aside from office supplies, media is really the only industry that people feel that they're entitled to the product of and often feel that they don't need to pay for. It. Say, my name is Lauren, and here I am shopping in a supermarket, and I steal a pencil. That's not right. <coughs> Lauren. <coughs> Enough with the pencils. No, I have to go over pencils and office supplies. It's part of the ethics thing. It doesn't help that broadcasters have been overcharging people for years, and more recently, Netflix and other streamers have been undercutting those broadcasters significantly, leading to a product that is hard to put a consistent dollar value on. And the parasite of it all, the scavenger, the great American maggot. <laughs> Here on YouTube, we're no stranger to viewers who don't want to see ads. Which is why I've written it into the Constitution that all my citizens must use Dashlight. Who sponsored this episode? Perhaps it's because they're used to getting no ads on Netflix or on illegally downloaded content, or perhaps it's because YouTube is seen as a decentralized broadcasting system in which normies film themselves and thus don't need access to high-end broadcasting equipment or more potently, broadcasting agreements. And since it's presumably just a solo person doing it, they don't really need to get paid for their work. Or at least that's been my impression as I'm constantly called a shill for taking sponsors on either of my channels. Of course I believe that it's just an outspoken few who actually object to creators getting paid, and the sentiment behind those negative comments comes as just a gut reaction to seeing those ads, rather than a conscious thought process as to why they're there in the first place. We are not talking about a small problem on the other side of the tracks. We are talking about a multi-million dollar a year business about smut peddlers who stain every neighborhood of every city in the country with their slime. Whoa, feels very luxurious. Such mutilation of heart and soul is totally justified because it shows a profit. 
The decline in young viewership on boomer platforms like broadcast television and an increased intolerance for linear advertising have had massive ripples in the media industry that have taken us back to a form of advertising that's been extinct for roughly 50 years. Howdy folks, I'm the old ranger with a new and exciting yarn. True, mind you, about the historic Death Valley country from which these unique products come. Twenty mule team borax and boraxil powdered handsome. This is our baby, Nita Louise. People say she's a doll. My secret for keeping her so dainty? Borax sweet. This is Martha with her pet kinkajou. All the girls live a free, happy life because their clothes are washable, thanks to 20 Mule Team Borax. Yes, for a better wash, add 20 Mule Team Borax to soap or detergent. I'd like to take a moment to show you how Boraxo's two-way action gets out dirt plain soap can't reach. Its rollaway action goes after the deep down dirt. Then, pour on some clean, sanitary Boraxo. So remember... Boraxo's two-way action gets out dirt that plain soap just can't reach. I'll be with you again two weeks from now with another true Death Valley Day story. And until then, I'll say so long. Remember, Borax sweet clothes. My job. In the early days of television, they adopted the then standard radio practice of having a single advertiser not only sponsor an entire program, but oftentimes produce and develop it as well. Sit back, light up a camel, and be an eyewitness to the happenings that made history in the last 24 hours. There was the Camel News Caravan, Texaco Star Theater, Colgate Comedy Hour, and many more. Oh, we're the men of Texaco, we work from Maine to Mexico, there's nothing like this Texaco of ours. Our show tonight is powerful, we'll wow you with an hour full of howls from a shower full of stars. We're the merry Texaco men, tonight we may be showmen, tomorrow we'll be servicing your cars. I wipe the pipe, I pump the gas, I rub the hub, I scrub the glass. I touch the clutch, I mop the top, I poke the choke, I sell the pop. I clear the gear, I block the knock, I jack the back, I set the clock. So join the ranks of those who know, and fill your tank with text of gold. Sky Chief, fill up with Sky Chief, and you will smile at the pile of new miles you will add. Fire Chief, fill up with Fire Chief. You'll find that Texaco's the finest friend your car has ever had. And now, ladies and gentlemen, introducing America's number one television star. This format gave sponsors a large amount of control over the programming, and they could prevent certain segments or stories from being aired if they thought that it would negatively impact their brand. They could also use every single aspect of the show to promote their product. Well, I'm going to tell you what else I'm going to do for your prince. With every harmonic, I'm going to throw in one of my French horns. And that's great for you motors that are stuck on a road miles away from civilization. Cause all you gotta do, friends, if you run out of gas, is play a couple of notes like this. And immediately, one of our Texaco dealers comes right to your rescue. Or even better than that, take out the amateur of the mouthpiece, friends, and you'll find an emergency supply of Sky Chief gasoline. Yes, indeed, friends, that's the gasoline with volatile control. That's the gasoline with a punch. In fact, the genre that now masquerades as Emmy award-winning content, the soap opera, got its name from early soap operas being owned by soap producing companies. They used their sponsored daily dramas, like the 1930s radio drama Ma Perkins, to promote their products, like Oxidol laundry soap, to the stay-at-home parents that were listening. Before we hear from our present today, though, I want to tell you about something else for a minute that will be of vital interest to every housewife listening. I bought a remarkable new laundry soap discovery that actually makes any other kind of laundry soap old-fashioned and out of date. It's the new, improved Oxidol, spelled O-X-Y-D-O-L, Oxidol. It embodies the latest scientific discovery of the world's greatest soap makers, the Procter & Gamble Company. Soap operas continued to dominate the sponsored content space for a really long time, with CBS canceling the last P&G-owned soap opera, As the World Turns, in 2009. As the world turns, brought 
to you today by Ivory Soap, 99 and 44, 100% pure. It floats. The single sponsor model was the reason that early television was so dominated by variety shows. They were cheap. You got money for the rent? Oh, the rent. No, no. money, the room, excuse the rent. Oh, no, 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 I'll pay for the rent. No, if it's all right you, you have it. I insist that I pay for the oh, rent. Oh, tush, tush, I'll pay for the rent. No, I insist that I pay. Oh, poof, poof, I'll pay for the rent. Oh, poof, poof, I'll pay for the rent. I don't care who pays. Well, then you pay it. Yep. <laughs> filming a juggler on stage is a lot cheaper than filming space politics. On average, an hour-long television program in the early 1950s cost around $30,000 to produce. Yet with competition from other networks, film pushing back, and audiences demanding new, interesting types of programming, by 1960, the average cost for an hour of television had tripled. Television simply became too expensive to subsist on a single sponsor model. And soon, the industry would adopt the model magazines had been using for years, having multiple sponsors buy out small blocks of the program. This portion of Star Trek is brought to you by RCA Victor. When you're first in color TV, there's got to be a reason. And by Pepsi-Cola, taste that beats the others cold. And by Geritol, the high-potency vitamin plus iron tonic that helps you feel stronger fast. This was great for the broadcasters, as no single sponsor had control over the program and it allowed producers more creative freedom. Beyond ad breaks, advertisers could also buy placements within the actual show, allowing advertisers to once again have the actual show promote their products. We're not going to drink that water anymore. No? Nope. Bought a whole case of this just for us. You can drink it right out of the bottle. What is it? Poland water. Right from the spring. Real water. You can read right here on the bottle. Poland Spring, Maine. Picks you right up. These product placements are still popular today and come in at a range of levels, from the low-cost, brand signage featured in the show, to the premium, characters interacting with a product, or even better, the product influencing the story. Cold cut combo. It's this last category where things can get particularly funny. I downloaded Zoom for you. Ever since this shift to a multi-sponsor format, advertisers have been trying to regain some creative control, increase their footprint, as well as recapture an audience that doesn't want them. One strategy has been to threaten to pull their advertising dollars from content that doesn't align with their values, forcing producers to conform or starve. Procter & Gamble tried this in the 90s to control the content featured in many daily talk shows, and more recently, a whole group of advertisers pulled their advertising dollars from YouTube unless YouTube started penalizing educational channels, or something like that. The past few years, this obscenity traffic and salacious newsstand literature have become increasingly worse, not only in content, but in volume. Yet despite the efficacy of some of these campaigns, they only really work in broad strokes, and they still leave the advertiser with limited control. The solution was obvious. Enter the world of branded content. Early versions of branded content were often presented as one-off documentaries or PSAs. No need for the bride to feel tragic. The rest is push-button magic. So whether you bake or broil or stew, the Frigidaire kitchen does it all for you. Don't have to be chained to the stove all day. Just set the timer and you're on your way. They resembled propaganda more than advertising. 1941, a fateful year. War and the beginning of a four-year blackout for commercial TV. And television enlisted for the duration. Research went forward at war tempo. At RCA's David Sarnoff Research Center, Princeton, New Jersey, 24-hour shifts explored every corner of the new world of electronics. Some were weirder than others, like this PSA from the height of Cold War nuclear fear in 1954 that promoted paint and varnish as a way to keep your family and home safe during the nuclear holocaust. Now, our third test. Three identical miniature frame houses, each with varying exterior conditions, all the same distance from the point of the explosion. The house on the right, an eyesore. But you've seen these same conditions in your own hometown. The house on the left, typical of many homes across the nation, heavily weathered dry wood in run-down condition. The house in the middle, in good condition, with a clean, unlittered yard. 
The exterior has been painted with ordinary, good quality house paint. Light painted surfaces reflect heat, and the paint also protects the wood from weathering and moisture damage. Let's watch the test now and see what happens under atomic heat. This documentary is an ad in disguise produced by the National Paint, Varnish, and Lacquer Association in order to capitalize on the Cold War by slinging some paint to frightened Americans. The house on the right is the first to ignite. The trash serves as kindling for the dry, weathered wood. The house on the left smolders for a few moments. Looks almost as if it will not burn and then bursts into flame. But the well-kept and painted house in the middle still stands. The house in the middle, cleaned up, painted up, and fixed up, exposed to the same searing atomic heat wave, did not catch fire. Close examination revealed only a slight charring of the painted outer surface. Yes, the White House in the middle survived an atomic heat flash. This format evolved into programming like infomercials, which, as entertaining as they can be, didn't really hit the mark. They put the product first and the entertainment second, usually. Now, you love salad, you hate making it. You know you hate making salads, that's why you don't have any salad in your diet. Watch this, one slap, salad. In the 80s, branded content was still largely foreign to mainstream culture. Come on, Battle Cat. An Eternian snail can move faster than this. While programs like He-Man and the Masters of the Universe and Transformers were branded shows specifically designed to sell toys to kids, these were children's programs, and it would be a while before the concept was turned on to adults. Decepticons! Counter-attack Omega Supreme! Transformers! Omega Supreme will stop them! By the early aughts, advertisers realized what they were doing wrong. For viewers to want to watch, the content had to come first. The early 2000s were the wild west for branded content, and one company in particular nailed it. Well, we got you here. <laughs> and in good time, too. In 2001, BMW teamed up with several cool directors, including Guy Ritchie, John Woo, and Ang Lee, to produce a series of very high-end mini-action movies that were secretly BMW commercials. They were pretty slick. Is that a car? Where are you? I'm in the trunk of his car. You're gonna be okay. You have to help me, please. We got ourselves on single triangulated. South Southwest San Pedro. Debuting at Cannes to rave reviews, the series of eight shorts, collectively called The Hire, were produced by David Fincher, Ridley Scott, and several others, and they prominently feature various BMWs in high-performance action scenes. They were quite popular, at least with my dad, and according to BMW, they were responsible for an increase in sales of 12% over the previous year. Please, don't stop. Three. If you stop, you might as well kill me yourself. Please. Slow down. No, oh, no, 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 no. Slow down now. Buckle up. But their biggest accomplishment, in my opinion, is that they managed to feel less like adverts than a lot of product placement in actual movies and TV shows. Denim. I was able to get the equipment. I'll meet you at the theater. Great, we'll see you there. We're still about 40 miles out. It's fine, we've still got plenty of range. While BMW seemed to have hit the cultural pulse with those slick Clive flicks, most brands weren't quite so successful. I'm sorry, I'm booked for someone else. It took a few years for the industry to catch on, but soon it would begin to snowball. In 2005, only five national advertisers produced their own content. By 2006, that number was up to 25. Was it true? <laughs> 2008 
2006 saw the premiere of The Game Killers, a show produced by Unilever to promote the scent of the eighth grade, Axe. It all began with a stick of antiperspirant and the marketing challenge to make it relevant to 18 to 24 year old guys trying to hook up with girls. To do this, we tapped into the universal truth that in the mating game, there are forces working against young guys. People whose sole mission in life is to ruin a guy's chances of hooking up with a girl. We called them the Game Killers. The rules of the show were simple. Keep your cool, which was also the promise of Axe Dry. The show ran on MTV and Comedy Network here in Canada, and it follows the format of a dating show, in which the male protagonist must, quote, get the girl by, quote, keeping his cool in the face of various game killers. Then it was the Eleven's turn to crank up the heat. Uh-oh. I am so hot. What would you do if an irresistibly gorgeous woman in nothing but a towel was locked out of the hotel room right next to yours, begging? to use your phone. One guess what Neil does. Hey, hey what's up? What's up? Oh, yeah. Here's a funny story. Do you always let strange people in your room? Wait, were you guys drinking wine? No. The girl he's dating, as well as all these so-called game killers, are all actors. And if the guy succeeds in outmaneuvering said game killers, he gets his name inscribed next to such legends as Leonardo da Vinci, Hercules, Romeo and John Hancock on none other than the Holy Grail. Of course. To brand the show, we produce animated shorts that offer tips on beating the game killers. They were integrated into the show as content rather than as traditional ads. Game Killers was a big success, both for MTV and Unilever, so much so that MTV ordered another five half hours in the fall of 2007. Beware, the game killers are coming to kill your game. September 21st at 7 p.m. only on MTV. But probably the most surprising thing is that this branded comedy TV show spawned an actual comedy tour, which was also branded. We even created a comedy tour called Game Killers 101, hosted by comedian and former Daily Show correspondent Mo Rocca. In most academic circles, a game killer goes by another name. That, of course, is from the original German, Kochblocha which made its way around college campuses across America. Unilever wasn't the only one getting in on the branded TV action. On August 17th, 2006, ABC Family aired a one-hour special entitled Schooled, a program created by Office Max. Schooled is a reality show centered around punking a bunch of eighth graders into thinking they have to pass a bunch of tests in order to get into high school. And if they fail, they'll be sent to eighth and a half grade. High school? Not so fast. The parents, the teachers, and the principal are all in on the joke. And at the end of the day, these students are rewarded with a surprise concert from Jesse McCartney, who reveals the prank to the kids, as well as the identity of their corporate overlords. All right, guys, we're gonna do one more song for you, but I had a great time. Thank you so much for having me here. We had a, we had a blast. I wanna thank Office Max, you guys rock. Appreciate all the support. Give it up for Office Max, guys. They made this whole thing happen. The show was a success for Office Max, though not ABC, who didn't pick up another special, and Office Max ended up shopping it around, eventually landing on the CW a year later, but this time with the All-American Rejects. Uh, back in April, we had a really bad flood here in the town of New Milford. Then out of the blue, Office Max gives me a call, and they say, they tell me that they heard what had happened and asked what could they do to help. Then they started to describe this show that they do called Schooled. The premise behind this prank is that the students are going to think they have to take this mandatory test and that they have to pass this test in order to keep the music program. Throughout this episode, these students are put through ridiculous musical tests, which are surprisingly quite funny. Familiar with uh, dances? Dances? Uh, I could try. Okay, samba. All right, Labada. Chicken. What note is this? Part of this is due to an early career appearance by Adam Pally, which from what I can tell might be one of his first TV roles. So I'm gonna ask you a question through the drums. I'd like you to answer me through whatever instrument you choose.
Interesting. Then the kids have to perform the theme from 2001 A Space Odyssey with no preparation time. Ahead of their performance for the judges, the producers bring in a ringer youth orchestra to flawlessly play the song. The reaction of the class is priceless. It's like watching a whole group of people just die inside. As the judges are absolutely tearing the students apart for their terrible performance, their principal comes on stage like a hero to save them. You can take your assessment and eat it. Oh. Just before revealing that, just kidding, it was a prank. Are you surprised? <laughs> well, guess what? I have another surprise for you. This has been one big prank. You've just been schooled. Then the All-American Rejects come out to blow the kids' minds, as well as the teachers, who rock out on stage and somehow convince the children to hoist them up to crowd surf. Here are the All-American Rejects! You just got school, baby! Of course, I can't play a clip of the concert without YouTube's copyright robots tracking me down, so I've swapped the audio for a track that slaps just as much as the All-American Rejects. Though the students do seem a bit more excited by the Office Max rep who hands their principal a giant oversized check for $60,000 worth of office supplies than the All-American Rejects concert itself. My name is Mark Van Geer, I'm from Office Max. We're here to help you school up, play a little trick on them, school you, but also give you what we were going to say $40,000, but we decided to give you guys $60,000. Both specials are pretty good from a content perspective and have fairly limited branding, with the only branding seen in the bulk of the show being in title cards and transitions. Though after the concert, the students do go on a shopping spree at an actual Office Max and seem to have a much better time buying pencils, paper, and printers than they did at the actual All American Rejects concert. I mean, it makes sense. Many of these advertisers pitch these shows to broadcast networks as a cost-saving measure for the network. The advertiser would offer the content for free in exchange for commercial airtime. Win-win for the broadcaster, or so the advertisers thought. 2006 was a big year for branded television, and like with Axe, digital was a big part of a lot of these programs. Mars created an online-only show called Instant Death, and it's a break from the reality format, and reality in general. You could lead a horse to water, but you can't make a fish. Whatever that means. Set in a low-budget CG world, Instant Death tells the story of four members of a hip-hop group that, in a Snickers-related disaster, are turned into hip-hop superheroes and have to save the world of hip-hop from the villainous Boo T. Now that we super dope hip hop superheroes, we need to put together a super dope show. So heads will forget about who be Boutillo. If you hadn't noticed, our heroes, Instant Death, are played by the Black Eyed Peas, and they face off against another familiar face, Terry Crews. I planted the cosmic catatonic mind blast disruptor myself. I don't know what happened. Shot entirely on a green screen, the series makes use of some very 2006 graphics, as well as a weird mixture of CG and real people. I guess they needed some extra shots, just like Peter Jackson. The series is very comic booky and does occasionally have some fun moments. 
like the Ninja Battle Showdown at the end, or when Terry Crews releases a grizzly bear into a nightclub. You know, stuff that normally happens in superhero movies. Much more so than Axe's Game Killers and Office Max's Schooled, the actual product of Snickers plays a big role in instant death. Not only does Snickers give the group their powers and save their lives, Cosmetatical what? Milliseconds before the actual impact. The disruptor and the Snickers concoction interacted and altered our DNA. What? What he said was, that bad a Snickers saved your butts. But at the end, the group, which has been fighting the hip-hop oppression of Boo T for five episodes at this point, was totally ready to give up their fight entirely if Boo T would give them some Snickers. Instant death. Welcome to the Booty family, baby. Yo, we got problems, B. Yo, tell them. Inform them. Where's my granolas, B? Boom. Where's my Parisian goat milk? Boom. Because you know a brother's lactose intolerant for real. And uh, where my Snickers at? Boom, boom. Satisfied? Now let's rock this. <laughs> While it doesn't end well for Boo T or Terry Crews, the show's narrator, which is a talking dog, obviously, does have a nice message for the people. Brought to you, of course, by Snickers. It can't be about the cash, it's gotta be about the hip hop. You don't take control of your culture, those who only care about the gold and platinum will. The science I'm dropping is instant death. The following year, one program would take the bold leap from TV commercial to TV show. Caveman. It's so easy to use Geico.com, a caveman could do it. What? <laughs> oh, no. I, not cool. I did not no. know you were there. Yes. I could know I could Based on the popular series of ads created by the Martin Agency in 2004 to promote how easy it was to use Geico, Joe Lawson, the creator of The Cavemen, took the series to ABC, who picked it up for 13 episodes. For some reason. I don't have much of an appetite, thank you. Though they wouldn't make it past seven episodes as the series was ravaged by critics. So there's this tiny waitress and she's carrying a rack of ribs so big that they can tip over a car made of stone. I just don't see what's so funny about it. Never, never do. Don't. Ever. While I do find Nick Kroll's sarcastic wit as charming as ever, the series is pretty hard to watch. Honey, uh, do your friends like their meat cooked? Because I can have the kitchen staff put out a plate of raw burger if that's how they eat no, it. No, Mom, it's fine. They cook. And unfortunately contains more branding for a faux Ikea than it does for Geico. Hi, I was wondering if you had any bedside tables with lamps already in them? Of course. Yes, that's called the Franz and the Z Blarnik. And the only mention of the caveman's origins is found in the credits. The city is swarming with chicks. Now you just gotta get out there and meet some of them. That's true, but keep in mind, this isn't like home where everybody's like us. So remember the rule, stick to your kind, crave the cave. While most of these shows can be tracked down with some effort through the annals of the internet, there is one branded show that has been effectively buried, whether intentionally or just through the mists of time. My White Whale, the McDonald's sitcom. Dude, I'm on like month six of trying to find this thing. About a year ago, a conversation with someone made me remember watching a sitcom on YouTube about 10 years ago when I was in university. I remembered that it took place in a McDonald's and that the characters would say cool catchphrases like, do you want a fry and a coffee? In order to promote McDonald's then new coffee venture McCafe coming here to Canada. It doesn't exist. It's been scrubbed from the internet. But every time I tried to find the show, my hours of searches were fruitless. My so-called friends had no recollection whatsoever of the program and accused me of being crazy. I've seen it with my eyes. I know it exists. F After months of searching, I finally decided that I would create a video about my descent into madness searching for this lost show. So I started recording myself searching on the internet to use as B-roll never expecting to find the show, until... Um, we've done birthday parties, a couple of anniversaries, and a retirement lunch, but... This has this to be our it. first TV pilot screening. Originals, this, this is amazing. And I'm even recording right now, this is perfect timing. This is for sure it. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, sorry for the delay, I had to grab a latte. Maybe a... Oh. <laughs> 
In 2011, McCafe had just launched in Canada, and in order to promote it, they created a sitcom. And it's amazing. I had to grab a latte. Maybe a comb is what you should have grabbed. This is combed. This is combed. Sorry. Anyways, start your engines. Titled Originals, the series centers around two characters who are documenting the process of creating a show pitch for a TV network, while using a McDonald's as their quote, creative HQ. Meta, I know. We're gonna be using this area as sort of our creative HQ. It's unclear if the pitch is for an actual TV show for broadcast. Well, um, we've done birthday parties, a couple of anniversaries, and a retirement lunch, but this is our first TV pilot screening ever. As when they eventually show it to the network executive, they specify that it'll be aired on closed circuit McCafe TV. <laughs> Perform live every week at McCafe's across the country. Originals bring reruns to life. An experience far too relatable for me, but that's another story. That was the worst piece of junk I've ever seen. Quite a mess, really. As I remembered, the characters do make use of cool catchphrases like, do you want to fry in a coffee? It's a classic. Oh, dude, I am gassed. I'm just burnt out. Did you want to grab like a frying coffee and call it a day? Call it a day? Yeah. Are you kidding? Yeah, this is going to go well. Set here in Toronto, the central struggle is that Bryce, the writer, keeps coming up with scripts that are based off of existing TV shows. What Grand Delay Industries? Grand Delay! Grand Delay! Oh, hang on! Oh, jeez, oh, Bryce! This is just Seinfeld. We're just, guys, we're just doing oh, Seinfeld. I love that show! Oh. All the while, Jason is attempting to win the heart of a woman who wants absolutely nothing to do with him by using his role as a producer to get closer to her. It's not great. I'm gonna move back just a little bit, just a little bit. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry about that. So, okay. It's not so, okay. It's okay. okay. So in this scene, you're gonna be playing the uh, hot girl that everyone loves, so that's gonna be a real stretch. Okay. For you, right? Okay, so are you gonna stand there, or are you gonna, is he gonna, you gonna stand oh, no, there? Oh, no, 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 okay, okay. okay. Mm. Actually, just, um, you smell like freshly harvested berries. Is that a... It's natural, so, oh. um, are we gonna start, we can that. we just start this? Remember that time we went okay. out for lattes, hmm? For a series made by McDonald's, set in a McDonald's, about a McDonald's TV show, and featuring characters that are really, really into McDonald's, I guess it's not surprising that it's hard to find a shot that doesn't feature McDonald's products or branding. They talk about and feature menu items, and they frequently call to attention the fact that McDonald's now has really good coffee. The lattes are pretty tasty, right? Mm -hmm. There's yeah. free Wi-Fi. Right. Okay, it's mostly, it's mostly the lattes. That was a really, really good latte. My guess is the reason you and your buddy chose to work from here is because it's relaxing. Uh, true. And the lattes. Our eyes met when he said, next please, and I ordered a mocha. The only thing hooking up the date was me and some caffeine. You want something? Yeah. Coffee? Sure, yeah. cappuccino would be great. I am on it. Oh, I hired a new barista. The guy really knows his espresso. Not only does every character seemingly always have a McCafe in their hands, but McDonald's products influence the direction of the narrative. Hey, you know, um, what kind of coffee do you usually drink? Caramel latte. Great. So go order something completely different and let that inspire something original. Yes, please, do that, please. Not to mention that the lead character is an ex-McDonald's employee of the month. How many employee of the months have you had? Uh, one, one. Oh, right, because two for me. Sorry, two times employee of the month. 
Yeah, over seven years. That's irrelevant. And two of the other recurring characters, including Jason's romantic rival, are both employees of McDonald's, uniform and all. This is pure advertiser gold, possibly even more so than Jack Daniels and Mad Men. I bet daily friendship with that bottle attracts more people to advertising than any salary you could dream of. That's why I got in. So enjoy it. Doing my best here. You don't know how to drink your whole generation. Unfortunately, the existence of the originals has largely been scrubbed from the internet. Likely by just how long 10 years is in internet years, but perhaps by the burger empire itself. Yet while today the world of branded content has become fairly homogenous, with sponsored articles you can't tell are sponsored, YouTube videos sponsored by Raid, and seemingly the entirety of Instagram, the ripples of the higher, schooled, and originals can still be seen. On the higher side of things, Red Bull continues to dominate by sponsoring every sport that would belong on the Ocho. Nike, Grey Goose, and PepsiCo have also jumped on the trend and have produced their own documentaries to relative acclaim. But that doesn't mean that the Wild West of branded content doesn't survive. It just has very few descendants. In 2019, Reese, the peanut butter cup company, teamed up with a bunch of YouTubers to create the world's first feature-length ASMR film titled Reese the Movie, a movie about Reese. And it's exactly what you'd expect, but with a little Doctor Strange love thrown in there. Look at all we've accomplished today. Look at all we've learned. All the wonderful and weird ways we eat our Reese. This is destiny. And now, a word from my sponsor. Wow, I really thought I'd have something for this. Well, it's been a while. Subscribe if you like, and thanks for watching. By now you must realize that you're the only one who can cause or demand the arrest, prosecution, and conviction of men like Garion. Go on, you can run away from me easily, but you can never run away from your own responsibility, it's yours now and forever. To deny it is to deny all that is precious and dear to you, all that is good in this life. But if you avoid that responsibility, then someday a generation must grow up to which perversion is commonplace. And that generation will, in its own perverse anguish, curse us all for having been so unconcerned. You must decide, my friend. You must decide very soon.